Hello there and welcome to my Skull the Hero Slayer guide part 2. Moving on from the last video, let's cover the second act. I'll be going over some of the stronger enemies you'll encounter and the boss fight. I'm also going to cover some of the strongest items and quintessences and tell you why I think they're so good. Before we get stuck into it though, I want to emphasize that for the remainder of the guide, I'm going to assume that you have the flexible spine trait to make your dash invincible. So if I mention dashing through an attack, remember that you need this trait, otherwise you will get smacked. So let's dig in. Starting off, I'm going to quickly cover some of the new enemies in Act 2 that can give players trouble. First off, we have the Spear Guy. He has two attacks. A fast-moving horizontal spear thrust that travels a fair distance across the screen. And an overhead swipe that has a deceptive amount of reach. The overhead attack has a very small windup and comes out very fast, but he only does it when you're actually above him. So my advice is to try and not be above him at all. His grounded thrust, however, has a much larger warning, giving you time to either jump up or dash through the attack to avoid it. The spear guy might be your first introduction to a new problem though, hyper armor or super armor depending on your naming preference. A very small moment after he lowers his spear to charge at you, he'll be surrounded by a yellow glow, indicating his armored status. Hitting him will no longer stagger him and therefore not interrupt his attack, just like the large hammer-wielding charges from Act 1. This glowing buff doesn't activate straight away, so if you're already hitting him, or hit him quick enough at the start of his attack, you can interrupt him from doing it. Stuns also interrupt this effect as well. Next up we have the Bow Guy, the new and improved basic little green Bow Guy from Act 1. As you would expect, they stand at a distance and shoot arrows at you. You can dash through them and jump over them. The red dot sniper sight that appears on screen gives you ample warning that he's about to shoot. The special thing to watch out for is that whenever you get close to him, or give him a second to breathe during your attacks on him, he'll activate his own super armor just like the spear guy. He'll jump backwards away from you while also shooting at you. This attack can and most likely will catch new players by surprise, but once you know about this move, dealing with it is rather easy. I'll quickly cover the new and improved Charger as well. Their attacks are basically identical to the ones from Act 1. The only changes are that the Hammer Slam now sends a shockwave across the screen, and that their charge has longer reach. Just like in Act 1, you can easily avoid both of these attacks by dashing to their backside as they prepare to do their attacks. They give you a huge warning and a lot of time to react. There are other special enemies in Act 2, but I don't believe they're troublesome enough to warrant their own section here. However, the next enemy most definitely does deserve it. The large maids, and by extension the smaller maids that they summon, are some of the most difficult and irritating enemies in the entire game. Their frustrations are legendary. So let's break this down. The first thing that the large maid will always do is summon a door, which opens up and releases three smaller maids from inside. They're always the same ones, two blonde and one redhead. The two blonde ones dash at you with super armor, stop just in front of you, and then swing with their brooms. You can jump over their dash, you can dash through their attack, or simply keep running in the opposite direction. They won't hit you after they stand still. The redheads are more irritating as they jump through the air and throw three plates at you like frisbees. They travel fairly slow, but they do a very good job of making you not want to jump up into the air. During all of this, the larger maid will now move on to her second attack, the dinner bell. There's a few short warnings to this attack, mostly the ding sound and the startup frames of the attack itself. It can be tough to dodge at first, but as you deal with it more and more and become accustomed to it, it gets easier. If you kill all of the smaller maids, the large one will open another door and summon more of them. So the strategy I recommend to you is to kill two of the smaller maids, but leave one alive. The large maid will only summon more if all three from the previous batch are gone. So by leaving one alive, you minimize the amount of maids that are on screen attacking you, and now you only have to deal with the dinner bell attack from the big lady. This enemy is regarded as one of the harder ones for a reason, and few people ever leave a fight with them unscathed. So continue practicing to get better at dealing with them, and no shame if they still give you trouble. 
Now, once again, at the halfway point of Act 2, you'll be met with an adventurer fight. However, this time, you'll have to deal with two of them at once. The adventurers themselves still do the same attacks and should be handled mostly in the same way as in Act 1, you just have an extra guy to keep an eye on now. The pairings are random, so some fights might be tougher than others depending on which pairs that you have and what adventurers you're better at dealing with personally. However, my advice to you is that if you ever see the priest girl, focus her first. She's the only adventurer with dedicated healing that can save her allies, so she really does need to go first every time. This is where the game begins testing your knowledge of the adventurer's movesets and your ability to avoid their attacks from multiple angles at once. But if you can quickly take down one of them, the fight becomes significantly easier. Good luck to you. Strap yourselves in because it's time to go over the Liana sisters boss fight. I'm just going to get this out of the way now. Many people do regard this as the hardest boss fight out of the three acts currently available in the game. There's a lot to go over, so let's begin. The sisters attack pattern is that they will both attack you using a variety of combination moves. After this, one of them tags in at random and fights you one on one for a short amount of time. After this, they both attack you again, rinse, repeat. They each have their own health bars displayed at the top. I'll start by covering their combo attacks. Firstly, they'll appear on both sides of the screen and aim several lightning bolts at you. They then launch these attacks at you two at a time, one from each sister. Similar to Yggdrasil's large orb attack, the lightning will track you right up until they actually fire. So the trick to getting around this is to stand in the middle and play jump rope. Wait for the first set to shoot, then jump up. As you avoid this first shot, the second pair will launch towards you in the air. You'll naturally drop down to miss those as well. Finally, jump to avoid the last set. While you can dash through these as well, I do suggest waiting until the very last pair and dash through those instead. Dashing any earlier can leave you vulnerable to the following sets. Next is a cross-patterned attack that's telegraphed by two yellow lines across the screen. Shortly after they appear, the sisters will then attack. All you have to do is not stand where the yellow lines are. Either take to the sky or dash out of the way. Lastly, they can simultaneously perform diving and or dashing attacks at you. The sisters will appear on screen momentarily before doing these attacks, so be ready to move. After a few of these combo attacks, one sister will dive down vertically to attack you and then stay to fight you for a bit. So let's cover the solo sister attacks. After landing, the solo sister will always perform a cut attack that leaves a yellow line effect on top of where you are. You can jump to avoid it, but I would suggest dashing instead to be extra safe. They can perform a solo version of the three lightning bolts attack. You can avoid this exactly the same as you would the double, it's actually just a little bit easier because you only have to worry about one side of lightning coming at you. The solo sister can also perform all of the dashing and dive attacks on her own. The difference is that the solo sister won't completely leave the screen to do them. So if they jump into the air, you know it's a dive on the way. If they jump back and take aim with their rapier, prepare for her to charge at you. The next attack has the sister raise her sword straight up into the air followed by a lightning effect covering her body. A moment later, a very tall and fast wave of light beams will shoot out from both sides of her. The attack is slow enough that you can run away in time. You can jump over it, but it can be risky as the light beams go up very high. I recommend dashing in towards the sister as the light attack fires. You'll bypass the attack and be right up close to hit her a few times before she's recovered. Lastly, the sister will cruise over to you and perform a series of pokes. She'll take aim, poke, and repeat three times. On the third time, she does a triple stab. This one is actually pretty easy to avoid as long as you aren't being greedy. Dash through her and or jump over her to avoid all three pokes. The multi-stab she does is your safe chance to hit her from behind and capitalize on pain. The sisters will continue to alternate attacking you together and then separately until one of them dies. After this happens, the remaining sister will become enraged and transform into a dark version of herself with improved attacks. Welcome to phase two. After she transforms, she always starts the fight with a cut attack which leaves a dark line. This is identical to the attack the solo sisters can use. It's just a little bit quicker. 
She has two different dive attacks which both have her teleport into the air. The first and easiest is a basic dive, the same as the sisters normally do. You can literally be running normally across the screen and she'll miss you, but to be safe I suggest doing a dash. Just don't stand still or jump up to give her a hug. The second dive sends out dark waves from either side of her that travel across the screen upon landing. You can jump over or dash through these waves. Both of these dives are repeated a minimum of two times before she does something else. However, she can do a third dive in a row, so be cautious. One of her more dangerous attacks is performed when she raises her sword into the air, summons three dark orbs which then take aim at you with dark lines. The attacks then fire a moment later. I strongly recommend dashing to avoid this one. I find that jumping can often land me in more trouble than it's worth. Also, don't be surprised if she uses this move a few times in a row. She's very angry. Next is her full screen lightning stab. She teleports to one side of the screen and takes aim. You'll see a very brief lightning effect which serves as a warning for you. She then zooms across the screen super duper fast. Either don't be on the ground when she does this or be a super pro legend and dash through this stab. After she arrives on the other side, Dark Lightning will start striking the ground following her trail. As she does her dash, bright spots are highlighted on the ground to indicate where the lightning will land. You can stand in between any of these spots to be safe. Alternatively, you can dash through the lightning as it comes towards you. But my personal recommendation to you, because I like you, is to move to the spot right up to her face. If you're standing within kissing distance, you'll always avoid the falling lightning and be able to hit her at the same time. Just be careful you don't accidentally move too far forward or backwards, or you'll get zapped. Finally, I hope. for her last attack, she teleports behind you and tries to give you a friendly poke. She does this twice. After the first two, she then starts covering the screen in dark lines. After she's completed her art project, she pauses for a small moment and then the lines will pulse dealing damage to you if you're touching them. Try and find an empty space on the ground to stand in, or you can dash with good timing to also avoid damage. And that's all of her attacks covered. I hope. As I said at the start, this boss fight is actually pretty hard, so practice is going to pay off here quite a lot. Some extra information to keep in mind is that upon completing her transformation into her dark form, the last sister will recover some HP for her total. This can be reduced based on how much health she had when she transforms. So there is an incentive to try and get both individual sisters as close to death as possible. However, this does mean fighting both sisters for a longer amount of time. So it's up to you whether you want a longer phase one to make the second phase easier, or a longer phase two and have the first phase be easier. Personally, I find phase 1 to be more tedious, so I prefer killing one of them quickly and then dealing with phase 2 at full health. What do you prefer? Okay, assuming your brain didn't melt like mine has, it's time to break down the strongest items and quintessences in the game, and more importantly, why they're strong. But remember, if I skip an item that you really like, or I'm hyping something up that you don't like, that's fine. There are a lot of items in the game, and your playstyle and preferences might be different. These are just some of the ones that are most commonly thought to be the best. So let's get the easy ones out of the way and start with quintessences. These first two are honorable mentions, Evil Eye and Medusa. I feel like these are underrated gems. Firstly, Evil Eye gives an impressive 65% magic boost and the use effect is a screen-wide stun. Super useful for those especially tough rooms. Medusa comes with a 40% increase in cooldown speed, which on its own is very good. The juicy part is that Medusa's use effect slows down all enemies caught in the attack, including bosses. That's right, Medusa is one of the only things in the game period, currently at least, that can inflict some sort of status on a boss. And with those honorable mentions out of the way, let's get to the actual best quintessences. First up is Shadow Knights. Boosting physical damage by 90%, it's the strongest physical quintessence in the game. Its use effect summons an army of horsebacked knights that charge across the screen horizontally, dealing a lot of damage. But more importantly, it gives the user a shield that absorbs 30 damage. This is what gives this quintessence great offensive and defensive properties. 
and because of how valuable the on-demand shield can be, even if you're making a magic build, Shadow Knights can still be worth picking up. Next up is Raven Lord, boosting magical damage by an incredible 100%, it's far beyond the second highest, which happens to be Evil Eye. The use effect creates a black hole that damages enemies while sucking them in towards the center before exploding for a final burst of damage. And finally we have Arc Demon. Interestingly, this one increases max HP by 60. So unlike Shadow Knights or Raven Lord, you won't gain much in terms of passive power. The use effect, however, summons a large cluster of orbs that seek nearby enemies and explode for big damage. It's very difficult to actually miss with this attack. It's often debated whether or not Arc Demon or Raven Lord is the actual strongest quintessence in the game, but because of that, I think it's safe to say they're both deserving of the title, depending on which you prefer or what you're after. Arc Demon is often seen as better for clearing the screen, and Raven Lord is often seen as being better for killing bosses or singularly difficult enemies. Okay, let's move over to items themselves, and just like with the quintessences, I'd like to give some honorable mentions. I'll be mentioning any inscriptions that do play a role in why an item is good, but I won't be going over the strongest inscriptions here. I plan to cover those in a future video where I go over strong builds. Broken Mana Engine is a favourite of mine not because your dashes leave explosive orbs on the ground, but rather the 30% increase to skill cooldowns. On top of that it comes with the Mana Tech inscription to really double down on the cooldown power. Skills are typically your strongest attack options, so anything that allows you to use them more is going to be good. This item also doesn't discriminate as to whether or not you're doing a physical or magical build. This is universally just a great item for anyone. Demonomicon is coming up next with a juicy 60% magic damage boost and reducing your swap cooldown by half a second for each kill you make. It also comes with the Mutant and Necromancy inscriptions, Necromancy being especially powerful. Just having one stack of Necro is enough to add significant power to your room clearing capabilities. Never overlook this. Mage's Necklace is another favourite of mine. Every time you use a skill, an orb is summoned that shoots several fireballs at nearby enemies. The item works best with skulls and builds that spam skills a lot, so it pairs especially well with mana tech items or anything that increases cooldown speed, like the previously mentioned mana engine. I also refer to this item a lot as Skull's best friend. His ability to throw his head and get it back so quickly means you can fill the screen with a lot of fireballs very, very fast. Silphid Wings is the dream item for all of you speedrunners out there, giving you an extra jump as well as increasing your movement and attack speed while in the air means you'll be soaring through at top speed. Even the slow moving power skulls will feel agile when you have this item. It doesn't add a lot in terms of combat power, but the utility that it offers you is enough to help with some difficult areas and boss fights. Simply being able to move in the air faster and having an additional jump can make a world of difference. Lastly, we have Dark Spirit Shade. He's the strongest of all the spirits, dealing great damage and coming with the Necromancy Inscription as well. I'll go over spirits more soon, but just know that Shade is great even without the rest of his crew. He's great at clearing rooms, he's great at taking down bosses, and the Necromancy Inscription is the cherry on top. Alright, that's it for the honorable mentions, let's get to the really busted stuff. Starting off with Mana Bone. The Bone items have effects that become more powerful the more skulls you have of their respective types. For example, Mana Bone here gets stronger the more balanced skulls that you currently have. There are two other Bone items, one for speed skulls and one for power skulls. The speed one is actually pretty good too, but the power one is currently lacking a lot. Mana Bone, however, is by far outpacing its siblings. Using your skills will cause an area effect attack to appear around you. The damage in size will increase the more balanced skulls you have up to two. Just like with the Mage's Necklace, this item is begging to be used with builds and skulls that can spam skills very quickly. So it pairs especially well with anything that increases skill cooldowns like the previously mentioned Broken Mana Engine and Medusa. But even without spammy skills, the damage it can put out is still amazing. The mere sight of Mana Bone can make me want to drop whatever build I'm currently working on and start aiming for balanced skulls. Master Fighter is very simple, but incredibly good. Boosting your magical and physical damage by 70% if there are two or fewer enemies makes it perfect for slaying bosses and big tough boys. The effect only cares about how close enemies are to you. So if your opponents are fairly spread out, this item still works for clearing rooms. 
It's particularly nice when it comes to killing the large maids before they can summon their friends. Infinite Bone is up next. Your skills have a 30% chance to instantly reset their cooldowns when used. This is actually god tier for real, no joke. Skills are often your most powerful attacks and being able to use them back to back with a reset on your cooldowns is just too good to pass up. It doesn't just stop at one reset either. The item can continue resetting your skills cooldown if you keep getting lucky, it's a thing of beauty. So hypothetically, you use your skull skill and it gets lucky and resets. You can then use it again and get lucky once more to have it reset again. And this can continue going until it just decides not to. The only skull in the game that doesn't actively benefit from Infinite Bone in any way is Fighter because his skills don't have cooldowns on them at all. But besides him, this item is too good to pass up and benefits every skull, every build, it doesn't matter. This item is fantastic and you should be taking it. Ritual Staff is next. It provides a 60% magic boost with a conditional second effect. It increases the skill cooldown speed of balance type skulls by 45%. So this is working just like Medusa or the Broken Mana Engine, but remember only for balance types. The 60% magic boost however is universal. It also comes with tactics and static as its inscriptions. Tactics itself only helps to further increase the damage of your magic attacks. Even if you aren't running balance skulls for your build, the item still has great benefits. But keeping an eye out for some balance types isn't a bad idea if you do get a hold of this nice and early. Ceremonial Dagger is actually very good for similar reasons to the Ritual Staff. It provides a thick and juicy 90% magic boost for 3 seconds after you land a critical hit. It also comes with tactics to further complement the magical power this item provides. On its own, this dagger is just fine, but when combined with items that boost critical hits, it really shows its worth. There's one critical boosting item in particular that pairs exceptionally well with this one, but we'll get to it soon. Thief Armor is one of those special items that can turn an entire run into a blitz if used well. All of your basic attacks now fire a shuriken. Critical hits from basic or skill attacks will fire a larger shuriken. It comes with Madness on it, one of the most powerful inscriptions. There are a few ways you can use this item to great effectiveness. Stack up Madness and Attack Speed and spam basic attacks for lots of small shurikens. You can also stack up lots of crit so that you get lots of large shurikens. And despite doing physical damage, it's quite useful for just about every skull in the game. It's worth noting that the large shurikens will spawn from every critical hit. So, if you have a skill or attack that will hit multiple times, and crits multiple times during that skill, you're going to see a lot of shurikens on your screen. As an example, Reaper's fire that he leaves on the ground ticks for multiple points of damage, and every single time that does damage, it has a chance to crit and spawn a large shuriken. And one of my favorite combos is to pair it with our next entry, Explosive Arrow. This is that special ingredient, that spicy sauce, the dark chocolate. Explosive Arrow makes projectiles explode on contact, dealing true damage in an area of effect. Skulls like Mummy, Archmage, and Alchemist might come to mind as having ranged basic attacks that you can make good use of this item with. And while that's true, the arrow synergizes insanely well with other items that have ranged effects of their own. For example, it makes all of the shurikens from Thief Armor explode as well. The Piercing Wind Inscription and Mage's Necklace Fireballs will also benefit from this. So even skulls that don't come with ranged attacks can actually build ways to make use of this item. It is not a ranged only thing that excludes all close range skulls. Seriously, do not overlook this item. And so we've come to what I and many others believe is the single most powerful item in the game. Thieves Black Steel Dagger. Or is it daggers because there's clearly two of them. Anyway, this item is actually ridiculous. Each attack you do increases your critical chance by 2% for 3 seconds, stacking up to 20 times. Meaning that its maximum effect is boosting your chance to land a critical hit by 40%. And just let me clarify, every time an attack you do deals damage, this thing goes up a stack. So if you have skills that hit multiple times, like Reaper's Fire, Ninja Shurikens, Rockstar's Amps, etc., they all count for each hit. This is true for item hits as well, like Thief Armor. It also comes with the Madness and Piercing Wind inscriptions, which gives you an easy window to at least one stack of Piercing Wind if you plan to pair it with Explosive Arrow. 
The fact that it comes with Madness, which increases your attack speed, only means that you'll build up the effect even quicker. This item is no joke and is simply a door to buy all skulls. It doesn't matter what kind of build you're doing, because at the end of the day, you're trying to kill your opponents and this thing makes you do it so much faster. Okay, so I'm going to give you a quick example of item synergy using Black Steel Dagger. With Black Steel, we gain Criticals, Madness for Attack Speed, and Piercing Wind. So let's also add Thieves Armor, which also has Madness. So we're now swinging faster with our basic attack, and we're also critting a lot more with all of our attacks, thanks to the daggers. This means that Thieves Armor will fire off a lot more of its large shurikens, thanks to the crits. So now, let's throw in our secret spice, Explosive Arrow. And so now, Black Steel Dagger is giving us a huge critical boost, Thieve Armor fires off shurikens, we're swinging faster, and both the shurikens and Piercing Wind Inscription are exploding for AoE bonus damage. These effects also help to ramp up Black Steel Dagger's sacking effect even quicker. Oh, and do you remember Ceremonial Dagger, that boosts magical damage after you land a crit? Exactly. Odds are your Ceremonial Dagger effect will be active every single fight due to the absurd amount of critical chance and power you now have. This is just an example of how you can build item synergy, so play around and see what you like. Lastly, it's time to cover the spirits. On their own, the spirits are okay, they do get the job done. However, the Elementalist Blessing item can make spirit collecting a very powerful investment for magical damage builds. It increases your magical attack by 50% for every spirit that you have. There are 5 spirits in total, Fire, Water, Wind, Earth, and Dark. We covered the Dark One Shade earlier. So, if you got extremely lucky and managed to collect all 5 spirits plus the Blessing, you would have a 250% increase to magic. But even better than that, all of the spirits, including the blessing itself, come with the fairy tale inscription. You only need five stacks of fairy tale, so you can afford to miss one spirit or the blessing. But when you do land that five out of five in fairy tale, you summon Oberon the Fairy King. Oberon may as well be Exodia himself in disguise. In addition to your small spirit army and all the bonus magic damage you've gained if you have the blessing, Oberon makes short work of most enemies and can be devastating to bosses. It's not an easy thing to achieve, but if you do, you're in for a good time. Good luck all you Pokemon trainers out there. That's it for part two. Wow, that was longer than I expected. But I do hope the guide taught you something new, or at the very least helped you in some way. Remember, if you have any questions or want some clarification about what I spoke about in the video, just leave a comment down below and I'll do my best to help. Keep an eye out for part 3 of the guide, where I'll go over Act 3 and the new threats you'll find there, along with the boss fight. Thank you again very much for watching, I hope this helped, and I'll see you later. Have a good one.